on the new reality. Intermodal facilities are a green game changer used to transfer goods between trucks and trains. There's just one problem with Milton. It's the wrong place. Some people will say this is NIMBYism, right? We're not against intermodal, but it does not belong beside residents. If you lived through it, it's not something you forget. They called it the Crippler. My dad remembered his youth. I mean, he was paralyzed all down one hand. He was blind in one eye the rest of his life. He didn't want another child to miss getting the vaccine. He, he knew what it meant to have polio. Hello, I'm Donna Friesen. Our first story tonight is about something most of us take for granted but couldn't function without. Railway lines, they crisscross this country and building them more than a century ago was not just an engineering feat, it was a way to connect the country and they remain a federal responsibility. So when CN Rail proposed a big new intermodal terminal in Milton, Ontario, people who live there had little say. It's a terminal where lots of trucks and trains will connect to carry goods vital to our consumer-driven lives. But for some in Milton, it's a monstrosity that will bring noise, choking traffic, and dangerous air pollution right into their backyards. Jeff Semple now on a 20-year fight that's about to reach its last stop. When Priscilla Burton and her husband moved to Milton 10 years ago, they knew this was okay, where they wanted to raise a family. The community is just an hour's drive west of Toronto, but offers an escape from the big city. Perched on the edge of a nature reserve, steps from walking trails and fishing pods. Milton's mix of country and city life has made it one of Canada's youngest and fastest growing communities. Milton was kind of like the perfect mix where it was like still GTA, but like it was, more, we had more access to like countryside and farms and conservation areas. And when it comes to her children's health, Burton can breathe a little easier. Her five-year-old son, Sebastian, suffers from asthma. And this community offers a breath of fresh air. We're always outdoors. Like, like Our kids are really outdoorsy kids, so we're usually always kind of taking walks along this path. But this family, like many others here, is worried. A new neighbor is poised to move in just down the street which could carry consequences for their health. We did come the, here for the kids, so that's still kind of one of our major points. So if we kind of start to feel that it's not a good fit and we're worried about what it's gonna mean for them, cut, cut, then that might be the decision to kind of move somewhere else. This community is now at a crossroads over a fight that's been gathering steam here for two decades. Back in 2000, this stretch of land, around 1,200 acres, was quietly acquired by a century-old corporation. CN, the Canadian National Railway, purchased the property with plans to build an intermodal terminal. Described in this promotional video, intermodal facilities are a green game changer used to transfer goods between trucks and trains. CN says the Milton facility would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by eliminating 200 million kilometers of truck travel every year. I mean, imagine how many trucks that would take to carry that train load of containers. Greg Gormick is a rail and transportation analyst whose lifelong love affair with trains runs in the family. Four generations of his relatives have worked on the rails, dating all the way back to CN's predecessor in 1882. Just talking about the railway and its rich history makes him emotional. Oh, I'm almost getting teary. Um... It's the national dream. It's what built Canada, the intercolonial railway from Halifax to Montreal, the Canadian Pacific, the original Western Transcontinental. You feel like you're part of history um, to know railroaders. It's, it, it, it's a family. But Gormick now finds himself in a family feud. He's an expert in intermodal logistics and worked for CN in 2000, back when it began purchasing the land in Milton. And right from the time CN announced its plans, Gormick was concerned. It's a great idea. I fully support it. There's just one problem with Milton. It's the wrong place. It shouldn't be there. 
CN's promotional video of the intermodal facility paints a sunny picture of a seamless supply chain, but the reality looks more like this. CN's intermodal terminal in the nearby city of Brampton. The facility, built in the 1970s, is now nearing capacity, struggling to meet the growing demand for goods from the greater Toronto area. The result? A slow, seemingly endless procession of transport trucks, rolling in and out 24-7, 365 days a year. People have the right to be concerned about what those emissions, those diesel emissions can do. Big picture, these intermodal facilities provide an environmental benefit by taking long-haul trucks off the road. But anyone living nearby risks exposure to potentially dangerous emissions from trucks, as well as noise, dust, and light pollution. That's why most of these terminals, like the one in Brampton, are built in industrial areas, far from residential neighborhoods. But in Milton, it's a much different story. CN's proposed site here in Milton sits just across the street from a sprawling residential area within a kilometer of thousands of residents, a hospital, and a dozen schools. So this is your property? Yes. Where would the facility be built? Right there, just across right the across the road. Yeah, to the Rita Vogel Post and her family have lived in Milton for 35 years. And she spent the past two decades fighting the CN proposal. How are you feeling at this moment? Uh, exhausted, um, but we haven't given up. Vogel Post recalls first hearing rumors that a group of anonymous numbered companies were buying up the land across the road. Nobody knew who it was. Then in the spring of 2001, there was an official announcement uh, that CN was proposing to build an intermodal terminal. And truthfully, we had no clue what an intermodal terminal is. But the more she learned, the more she worried. The proposed site would see 800 transport trucks coming in and out of the facility every day. The nearest non-toll highways are 10 kilometers away, meaning those trucks would roll along local roads and residential areas. Some people will say this is nimbyism, right? Not in my backyard. Absolutely, and I can understand that. We're not against intermodal, but let's be responsible with where we're placing it. It does not belong beside residents. In response to CN's proposal, Vogel Post spearheaded a campaign. The professional graphic designer produced and distributed these pamphlets, hosted rallies, and addressed community meetings. I think they realized that we weren't just a quiet community that we're going to roll over and just let this happen. In 2008, facing widespread community opposition, CN hit the brakes on the intermodal terminal. And for nearly a decade, the proposal and the property lay quiet. But then, in 2015, CN suddenly changed course, announcing its plans for the Milton Terminal were back on track. And what was the reaction? People were alarmed. And for good reason. The federal government appointed an independent panel of experts on the environment and transportation to review CN's proposal. In its 400-page report, the panel found that most of the adverse environmental effects are likely to occur whether or not the project proceeds because the lands have been designated for future development. But they concluded the terminal is likely to cause significant adverse environmental effects on air quality and on human health as it relates to air quality, noting three contaminants in particular would exceed air quality criteria, one of those by 2600%. All three of these are what we call known carcinogens in humans. Christian Larson is an environmental health expert who studies Canadians' cancer risks. These are non-threshold contaminants, so we don't have an acceptable level. We don't know at what level will you start to have a health outcome. Health Canada found CN had not adequately assessed the health risks from diesel exhaust and recommended the corporation reduce emissions of non-threshold contaminants associated with diesel exhaust. I don't think they've they've done enough to estimate kind of lifetime exposure risks, um, like uh, especially related to cancer. Considering how close the terminal would be to homes and schools, the panel also addressed concerns about cargo. CN says around 3% of the containers, some 12,000 per year, would house dangerous goods, such as household cleaning and lawn care products. I mean, you've got trains going through with things like sulfuric acid. 
But the panel concluded that the risk of a serious accident, including a major derailment, was low. And intermodal terminals have a strong safety record, according to Transport Canada. I'm not wildly concerned about um, an accident where there's going to be an explosion or anything. I'm more concerned about the long-term uh, health effects. Those lingering health concerns don't sit well with residents, including Milton's mayor. Am I about to gamble with a community? No, I'm not. Gord Krantz is the longest serving mayor in all of Canada. During his 40 years in office, he's seen his community transformed from a small town to a population of 140,000. So, and again, you can see in the distance there, a new uh, school being built. To accommodate that rapid growth, the city crafted a long-term plan to build businesses, homes, and schools. Mayor Krantz says CN's intermodal terminal would put those plans in jeopardy. Was CN coming to the table and asking if they could do this? No, they weren't. Uh, I would caption that uh, they were telling us some of the closest residents will be probably within yards, uh, meters of this facility. CN declined our request for an interview, but in a written statement, the company noted the review panel found CN's criteria for site selection were reasonable. The proposed site could support an intermodal terminal and that CN has identified and considered the effects of alternative means of carrying out the project, including alternative project locations. It's the average citizen out there, and I'm not just talking about one or two, and I'm talking about the masses of the people who just don't want it. This video is one of several produced by Milton and surrounding communities opposed to the project. Over the last 20 years, the region's political leaders of all stripes and levels of government have been united in their opposition to CN's plan. Normally, that would be enough to stop a development in its tracks. But in this case, the community doesn't get to decide. The rules governing rail companies are as old as Canada. Written way back in 1867, the Constitution ensured railways were the domain of the federal government. At a time when their ability to build and connect the country was essential to the economy. The result today? While most industries require a community's approval to build, CN's fate falls to the feds. This could be Saskatoon, this could be Vancouver, it could be Halifax, it can be anywhere. There are all these concerns and I just feel that CN is, pardon the expression, railroading this one through. Liberal MP and former Olympian Adam Van Coeverden won this riding in last year's election. He says the CN proposal was the top issue and he's calling on cabinet to side with his community. Um, they've been loud and clear. CN Intermodal just doesn't have a, a welcome home here in Milton. As always, we will move forward in a responsible way. And The Trudeau government has delayed its decision on the Milton terminal until sometime in December. But Burton and her family aren't waiting around to find out if CN gets the green light. They're kind of putting their company's interests ahead of our health and like the good of our town. They're moving to the other side of the city, further away from the proposed site. Obviously we know like Milton's a growing community, there's going to be different things that come in, we know that. But it has to be the right thing at the right place for it to make sense and this just isn't. Coming up on The New Reality. My dad remembered his youth. He didn't want another child to miss getting the vaccine. That was one of the worst things about polio, who it went after, mostly children. Nobody knew if it was a bad batch or if in fact there was a problem with the vaccine. If he had stopped in Canada, that would have kept the balance. We're all watching and waiting for scientists to pull off what's never been done before, creating a safe and effective vaccine for our coronavirus. One man watching perhaps more closely than most is a former Canadian Prime Minister. Paul Martin had polio as a child, before there was a vaccine. Back then, polio paralyzed or killed over half a million people around the world every year. Martin's story is personal. It's about the life-changing impact of a vaccine, but it's also a cautionary tale. Here's Mike Armstrong. If you lived through it, it's not something you forget. Polio targeted children, 
It stole lives, the ability to walk, even the ability to breathe. The nickname didn't help either. They called it the Crippler. Every kid was warned by his mother and his father. One person who remembers what those years meant is former Prime Minister Paul Martin. We sat down recently, at a safe distance due to COVID-19, to talk about another virus. As a boy growing up in Southern Ontario, his parents would tell him not to play around water that could be contaminated, but the warnings didn't work. He was eight years old when he told his mother he felt something strange in his stomach. The next thing I knew, I was in the car on the way to Hotel Du Hospital in Windsor. There was no if, buts, or maze. Uh, she had been warning me about polio ever since I was born, and it happened. It was all kids my age. That was one of the worst things about polio, who it went after, mostly children. It's a virus spread usually through contact with infected fecal matter. In bad cases, it infects the spinal cord and causes paralysis. It can even paralyze muscles around the lungs. These massive machines helped paralyzed children breathe. Martin remembers when one was wheeled into his ward. An older boy explained what it was. They brought in an iron lung. I had never seen an iron lung, but I had it in the lungs. And uh, I, I turned to him and I said, what's that? And he said, that's an iron lung and that's where you're going to end up. And I gotta tell you, then I suddenly realized what I was in for. It's hard to imagine what parents went through, dropping off their children, hoping for help when there was no cure. If children got better, it wasn't much more than luck. But for Paul Martin's parents, there was a reason for even more fear. Paul Martin Sr., as a boy, had polio as well. My dad remembered his youth, and he was paralyzed all down one half. He was blind in one eye the rest of his life. He didn't have any uh, capacity to use his left arm or his left shoulder. Um, but as a kid, he was his brothers and sisters used to pull him around in carts. And he recovered from that and was able to, he was able to walk and to write. And, and lead a fairly productive life. And led a fairly productive life. The Honorable Paul Martin, Secretary of State. Paul Martin Sr. is in fact one of the most accomplished political figures in Canadian history. An MP for 32 years and a cabinet minister under four different prime ministers. In fact, he was health minister during Canada's worst polio epidemic. In 1953, there were 9,000 cases and 500 deaths. Winnipeg was thought to be, at the time, the worst hit city on the planet. The medical world held its breath. Well, at the same time, something else was happening too. Progress. In Pittsburgh, Dr. Jonas Salk had developed a potential vaccine. Among the first to be injected, even before widespread trials, his own children. This was his eldest son at nine years old in 1953. His laboratory, just one floor above was where the kids were in iron lungs. We spoke to Dr. Peter Salk from his home in California. He himself is a biomedical researcher. Now, one part of Canada's involvement in the development of the vaccine is well known. It was Connaught Laboratories in Toronto that came up with a way of producing polio virus on a massive scale. Thousands of liters were shipped to the U.S. Salk's lab would kill the virus or inactivate it so that when it was injected, the body wouldn't get sick. It would create antibodies. Reporters grabbed copies of the official statement. After two years of tests involving a million children, the announcement was made April 12th, 1955. The vaccine was safe and effective. But there was a crisis around the corner. Uh, this was probably one of the worst moments of, of his life. Within two weeks of the vaccine's rollout, vaccinated children started getting sick. In fact, they were turning up paralyzed, usually in the limb where they'd been injected. Now, nobody knew if it was a bad batch or if, in fact, there was a problem with the vaccine. So the Americans stepped in and stopped the vaccine. Right across the country? Right across the country. Paul Martin Sr. was the Canadian health minister at the time. When the U.S. suspended its vaccination program, he was under pressure to do the same. Well, Martin says his father spoke to his experts and decided to keep going. If he had stopped in Canada, that would have stopped the vaccine in North America. That would have, that would have, that would have tipped the balance. 
As it turned out, Martin was right. A company in California had produced a bad batch of the vaccine. Cutter Labs hadn't followed the Salk procedure and ended up injecting children with live polio virus. 40,000 developed a mild form of the infection. More than 150 were paralyzed permanently. 10 died. This was a devastating experience. Um, you know, there were you know, many, many lives that were altered um, dramatically. It came to be known as the Cutter Incident. The U.S. eventually figured out what went wrong and seeing things were working in Canada restarted its program. It turned out only to be a temporary setback in part because of the Martin family's experience. He didn't want another child to miss getting the vaccine. He, he knew what it meant to have polio. 65 years later, as the world looks again for a vaccine to solve a crisis, the Cutter incident is a reminder of the importance of getting it right. Both Martin and Salk say what their fathers went through show reason for caution, but also confidence. The polio vaccine was a solution to a terrifying disease, a lesson learned for the pharmaceutical industry, and an example of what science and cooperation can accomplish. This was a great partnership between Canada and the United States, between Dr. Salk and Connor, and I'm very proud of the role my father played. Next week on The New Reality. I don't understand how someone dies during a wellness check. Frankly, uh, along with many Canadians, I'm pissed, I'm outraged. There is a stigma, there is an association that people have in their minds between mental health crisis calls and violence, but in the real world, it just doesn't exist. We're talking about peer workers, we're talking about mental health nurses, we're talking about clinicians. These are the folks that we really want to be a part of our mental health crisis response teams. There's a space in there for somebody other than a uniform. The New Reality will be back next Saturday. I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for watching.